let's just kind of check in on, um, I'd like to hear what some of your thinking has been, because I know that you've been going over some ideas and, um, yeah. Um, well, the first thing, you know, a while back that I came around to what I mentioned to you guys was about, um, this term sovereign science and what that means to me and why sovereignty has been such a big word in my life the past few years. Um, and I know that that's a word that is used in, in, in the crowd that you hang with <laughs> and the natural law. So whatever, whatever concepts I'm talking about that you want to chime in at some and apply it to what you know with the natural law and, and all the things that you study as well, that would be awesome to make those ties. I really mm -hmm. love when, um, and I really look for where things are similar, where things overlap rather than look at the differences between things. So I think that that's awesome. important. Yeah. And so this idea of sovereignty, um, because I feel like a very, uh, someone who doesn't go with the crowd, someone who doesn't like authority very much. I think maybe in my younger years, I would have related sovereignty to that. But for me, though, over the past four years, it's more about, has been more about emotional sovereignty and removing the programs that kept me in codependency that I learned from when I was younger. That's what I was raised with. A lot of emotional codependency where I'm making somebody feel a certain way and, and that's what I learned. So when I started to um, have, you know, uh, serious relationships and children and whatnot, it was all about understanding where I end and the next person begins. And this idea of taking back my sovereignty and, and being myself and not being meshed in or thinking that I had to be like somebody else, even though even in these relationships that I, I was in, more serious relationships as I got older into my 30s and, and even 40s, um, these people I picked to be in my life were, were kind of wanting me to be them and not allowing me to be myself, right? This idea of your opinion or your emotional experience or your perspective isn't as valid as mine, which, you know, there's a term thrown around a lot now, but those are some tendencies of narcissism that are mm -hmm. obviously rampant in this society for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I really found them playing out in my personal life and I had to deconstruct all of that, all of the programs to get back to this idea of sovereignty. And through this experience and other experiences layered on top of that, it um, it's a science. And, you know, Leslie, I first met you, I think, in crossing at um, the Center for Spiritual Living, which teaches about Ernest Holmes. And I love that his books are the science of mind. Mm -hmm. And the similarity and the overlap that I came to with my yoga studies. So I've been a yoga student since probably 2000, 2001, teaching for 12 years, is that the yoga sutras, kind of like a culmination of um, a type of yoga philosophy is also right in the front of the book. It's like, this is the science of mind. Awesome, I love that connection. Yeah. All right, I think we're already in and have recordable material. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and just introduce, call in the show, have Derek say hello, and then I'll officially kind of introduce you quickly. Yeah. And we can just keep going with the direction you're already going. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any thoughts, Derek? Um, yeah, just, I'm gonna ask questions that, you know, pertain to, you know, what were our channels about, you know, I like to know your observations and insights as to what you've noticed as like, people are polarized on, you know, the practices that you do, and the philosophies that swirl around spirituality and in, in, in the yogi realm and all that jazz. And yeah, and yeah, and like, what, how can we separate the true from like the fake and the pseudo and the pretentious whatever kind of stuff but yeah mm -hmm. to be really be in alignment with that true sovereign being yeah i like it cool. <laughs> I, mean, I know you can dig it so yeah <laughs> sure. we'll just, we'll flow i like it <laughs> all right well hello everyone welcome to dissolving the divide we have another wonderful guest with us Cavalia. Poyer, did I get your last name correct? Yeah. Uh, Poyer, right? Poyer, yeah. Poyer. Poyer. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome. I um, 
I want to inter- you know, say hello to Derek over there in France. Welcome. Yeah, bonjour. Yeah. Uh, il n'y a pas beaucoup de parties uh, chez moi, mais bon. Uh, yeah, really happy to yeah to have you on, Cavalia, Candice. Um, that's how I knew you originally. Met you in person. It was really cool. Just y'all got a really cool crew or just, you know, a little congregation gatherings going on in, in the local town that you guys are around up in the Shasting, Reading area. And yeah, I was really honored and yeah, really loved to hanging out with y'all. And, and yeah, so it's it's uh, really cool to learn more about you and, and what you've been doing for, for a while. You're a yogi instructor, you do natal chart readings and that nature. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks, so much. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate totally. it. I always yeah. love talking to you guys <laughs> in person, even over the internet, we can do it. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I, I really am glad to have um, you close by in person and uh, to be able to uh, be inspired really by you and um, work out together too. So it's all good. Oh yeah. So, no, yeah. We, it was Leslie and I build energy together. We get going in the morning sometimes. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I really um, appreciate, appreciate you in many ways, but one is really how in, how you are aspiring to really integrate knowledge and seek truth towards healing. And I think that that today um, we're going to kind of venture into a variety of places, but I think we're really looking through an integrative lens to the self and healing, uh, the mind, body, spirit in unity kind of topics. So um, please share a little about the things that you've been studying and the topics mm -hmm. that, in, that inspire you that you've been integrating. And yeah. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'm going to throw in some astrology references here and there because um, I can even, we can even look uh, at my chart if we wanted to, just as an example at some point, maybe down the road after we get through all this. But um, so, yeah, healing and what I love to study. I, as everyone has, have grown up with certain conditioning and certain environments that maybe weren't exactly conducive to who we are. And who we are is really where yoga starts. Um, besides the movement of yoga, which I, I love, and the energetic practices and the breath work and even the chanting and all of that, I, I really appreciate so many aspects of it. Yoga starts with who am I <laughs> and what am I? And I really think at like 13, maybe even a little younger, I started to just ask myself these questions. And I really had this deep curiosity of wanting to know things that were unknown. And it almost felt like a mental pressure. I know, just like, which I'll come back around to later. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. So I just have always just found myself so curious. And I, as I got into kind of little spirituality, I grew up Catholic. It was a very big influence in my life, Bostonian, Irish grandparents and whatnot, and um, New England mm -hmm. uh, has some pretty rigid ideas of what, <laughs> how things go. <laughs> so I grew up Catholic and at, by 16, I recognized as I was supposed to make my confirmation to the Catholic church, I, I had these words come over me. I am not confirming to something that I don't really believe in. And so I went a different path. I had a bunch of friends who were part of this Baptist youth group and I started hanging out with these, these Baptists and we would go to festivals and, and learn about things. And I just kept learning and I had this curiosity in me. So when I got older, I think I bought this book called Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. And it was all cones of like where you really had to contemplate, like, what are they talking about in these four lines? And that got me going and kind of led me to Buddhism. And I studied that and I love the concepts, but it didn't... Um, I didn't do it for me. Then I realized that this uh, yoga philosophy, so back in 2010, I started this yoga training and um, my teachers were so wonderful and so experienced. I realized that this, this is the way I, I see things. The organization of the way that they talk about things, this works for me. So got into yoga and that was a big piece in the yoga philosophy and reading and reading, understanding then the difference between the different philosophies because there are different philosophies. There's the Samkhya understanding where things are duality and there's 
polarity and everything. And then there's more of the tantric view of um, oneness and only looking to the oneness and only looking to that one pointed focus. So, right. And then I started to find all these different things. What I love to study about right now is Jungian psychology <laughs> and the type of astrology kind of is on that same wavelength is evolutionary astrology. So it's a, a deeper look at your soul's purpose and even maybe into the past lives and then into where your soul is going with the idea that we come in here as a unique blueprint and a unique energy that our soul needs to work out things and balance things and overcome things from the past. So that's where um, a lot of study of astrology has led me into this evolutionary astrology. Right, fascinating. You've talked about um, a, a concept you call sovereign science and, and that this is, you can tap into the sacred sovereign science like through the study of self and the body, right? So how yeah. are you com combining or integrating the yoga and the various yogic paths with the study of hum human design and astrology, evolutionary astrology? Because you have yeah. a unique, um, process of how you Where see. they all overlap is that, you know, we each have a unique blueprint mm -hmm. and, um, you know, part of yoga that I really follow is something called Kriya Yoga. And this is a little bit different than Paramahansa Yogananda's Kriya Yoga that people are probably very familiar with if they're in that world. And there's also a Kriya Yoga taught with Kundalini Yogis, which is one of the yogas that I teach. But this Kriya Yoga comes from the Yoga Sutras and it's Tapas, Svadhyaya, and Ishvara Pranidhana. Mm -hmm. And tapas are the austerities, as they're called, but they're the practices that um, build heat in the body, whether it's through breathing or moving or even just meditation. It's a yogic fire and it burns impurities, physical, mental, emotional, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're deconditioning in a way, we're burning impurities away. Mm -hmm. And then Svadhyaya is scriptural study or self-study. And Ishvara Pranidhana is belief in a greater source, belief in God. Mm -hmm. and so these three things are very personal to me. Of all that I've read, I, I just keep coming back to uh, these three places. And astrology and human design, as you mentioned, um, human design is another way to read your natal birth information. I like it as well as a system. I, I really dig the organization of it because you can visually see something and it gives you practical advice, right? Astrology is not always practical advice. You're going off what someone else says, unless you learn all the things and all the placements. So um, where they overlap is that human design and evolutionary astrology ask that you decondition from all of these outside programs, from programs given to us in our childhood, from our environment, from society. <laughs> There's like, there's um, masks that they have asked us to wear that cover up our true self, and our true essence. Mm -hmm. And so I think is a really big uh, word that um, human design asks us to listen to our energy. What is your energy type? And in yoga, it's your, it's your life force. It's your, mm -hmm. product, your soul in your body, which is also your intuition, right? Life force, soul, mm -hmm. intuition. I don't separate these things. It's your energy in your body and it runs differently and it vibrates differently than another person. So coming back, just keep coming back to that soul essence of who you are. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Do you have, um, what, what are the steps, I guess, you know, someone stepping into these studies brand new what what is, are the steps of learning that you you would recommend or advise? I see a really big disconnect in our society because we're so distracted. And because we learn through modeling, right? Literally mirror neurons, we learn from these mirroring from the people around us how to be, what to do. It's really about making space in your life to take away all the distractions, 
to put the phone down, to create space, to just be with yourself and just feel. And I know that this is the most challenging thing for people is to put down everything. I mean, see everyone at the end of a yoga class, <laughs> we do all this movement and they're doing it and doing it. And then they get to the part where they have to close their eyes and do nothing. And they're like fidgeting and twitching and looking at their <laughs> eye watches. <laughs> and it's like, wow. this, might, this might be the most challenging pose to just wow. create space because the body, because we are that, divinity in a body right there's always duality here it's the the law of polarity or the law of opposites we live in a binary world like there's no doubt about it we have an inner and an outer but because we're inside the body it's the body from my perspective that we need to work with in order to um let that expression of ourselves come out so practices in the body right sitting that might be the hardest one. So what can you do first? You can do some movement and then you can try sitting and closing your eyes, meditating. Mm. One of my favorite practices that's beneficial in so many ways, there's so much out there on this now, is breath work, right? So you you focus the mind to something as and and then there's your um, eka grata, your one point of reference. So you can follow your breath. Uh, yoga nidra is a great kind of starting point for people, especially if maybe if they're on their way to go to sleep and they have some habits mm -hmm. on their screen, you can let yeah. them mind follow. Um, but yeah, but practices that help you to create presence and really sit with whatever is in there. There's all kinds of feeling, there's all kinds of sensations in the body. <laughs> Yes, that but often people are running away from or really, con you know, attempting to avoid. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And even in that discomfort, there's a lot of knowing, right? Because we're in the body, like the body knows. The, your body will speak to you. And I know it's not just me. I think everybody has their own gifts of like heightened sensitivities in ways, really in psychic different ways. I'm a feeler. I know some people visualize and they see things, but when you really start to decondition and all that extra stuff kind of goes away and you sit with yourself, like some of these gifts can really come up, come up for you. So yeah, I just feel a lot. Yes. Yes. I mean, as a teacher, but uh, yeah, it'd be nice if people can avoid so much pain to learn the hard way every time. I mean, like <laughs> it's 2024 y'all. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's interesting how, um, you know, you mentioned that through the body that we can find ourselves spiritually, really. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we are this interesting combination of both material or physical beings and spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. And the spirituals, this kind of hard to hold on to or see or define. Um, and so it seems counterintuitive to find spirit through the body. So I'd like, I'd love to hear you share more about why that's, that is so true and so important. Yeah, I kind of break it up a little differently when I talk to people about, we have a physical body, we have a mental body, we have an emotional body, and then we have the spiritual body. Mm -hmm. And in yoga, I like the way that they break up the spirit or the soul into kind of two different ways of talking about it, which is the atma or the jiva, which is your individual soul, your individual blueprint. And then there's the paramatma, which is the overarching love, or overarching energy that is everything. It's in everything. Everything that's animated with life mm -hmm. is the paramatma. And then we also have our individual atma or jiva, sometimes it's called. So, yeah, and this is the point about astrology, and I, I heard years ago, and it stuck with me so much, is that you cannot actually separate yoga from astrology, and there's a few different ways. <laughs> so when we come into this world, and yes, we have our DNA and our ancestral lineage, lineages that in uh, human design, it actually shows us that, and then it shows us this. The second we came into this world and took our first breath, right? This is an important moment. At that moment, we're bringing, we're separated from, we'll go from one to two, our own self, and we we take in 
oxygen. We take in prana for the first time on our own, on our own. But as we know, and we, you know, maybe you've heard this before that the, the music of the spheres, right? That the universe and the planetary bodies and the stars are all have a sound. They have music to them. You can go in the opposite direction with science and say, NASA has said that planet <laughs> Neptune, right? Vibrates at this frequency, however you want to look at it. When you come out and you take your first breath, you're getting imprinted with where those planetary bodies are at that moment, where the moon is, where the sun is. So, um, yeah, so coming into that moment is, is pretty spectacular. And this is why your blueprint starts from that moment. And this is why who you are, these energies are with you. I don't remember your original question, but I think that we're going in the right direction. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we can get back to that in a second if you got it written down, Leslie. But uh, just to tail off of that, I'm really interested as far as, you know, through the world of, you know, perspective lens of yogi and, and their teachings and all that yoga. Mm -hmm. sorry, um, obviously, it stems from India. Am I correct? <laughs> yeah. And they usually use the Vedic system. So how does that mm -hmm. differ from, you know, folks that are into yoga and they're using the tropical system? I know this is kind of a point of contention and it's not really my specialty, but what I what I've come to understand generally is that Western astrology is based off a certain angle of the sun, which just changes everything a number of degrees rather than where things are in the sky. It's also called sky astrology, they're, they're calling it now, like where things actually are in the sky. From our perspective here on earth, it's different. It's different, it's a different angle. So generally that's the difference between. So yeah. I would be a Pisces in Vedic astrology and um, I can relate to that a bit because I actually have a Mercury in Pisces, which is why things come out of me kind of watery and a little like, you know, a little uh, illusional sometimes, <laughs> not quite as direct as I might want them to be or somebody else wants them to be. But um, so I can relate to that Pisces energy, but I don't feel like I'm a Pisces. And this is where I kind of want to get into like, this is where the experiments are. This is the science part of it is we do these experiments I, I'm very keen at seeing patterns, whether it's in nature, whether it's in energetics, right? Really everything I do and everything I talk about is all based in energetics. Like I said, I feel everything, I feel it deeply and I can sense the difference between different energetics when I walk into a room or when I'm with a person. So um, the idea of that is, what was I gonna say next? Oh no. <laughs> So, so tapping into our blueprint. Oh, oh so tapping into. Hold on, I want to go back to the science piece. Yeah. That's what's right, important. Yeah, the is we do we do these experiments. What works? This is what yoga asks us to do. Try doing this breath work for thirty days. Has something changed in your life? Do you feel different? Right. What What is different? So do these experiments, and when you start to see patterns in things, and you and you take a bigger perspective, which is also what these practices, meditation or breath work, they can lift our awareness, our consciousness up to see kind of overarching. You can see what things work and what things don't, and that's part of the science of it. And you can do this. Um, I, I thought of three things. I think these are important to kind of mention right now. Going back to like what it takes is like it takes curiosity. It takes a lot of curiosity. It takes space. First of all, you got to give yourself space, but a lot of curiosity, especially if you're di diving into things of like the pattern of why does this keep showing up in my life like this? Why are these pain, this the same feeling of heartache? Why is this showing up again and again and again? When you go into those places, it does take curiosity. It takes compassion for yourself. It takes courage <laughs> and it also takes connection. Mm -hmm. And that's really why I named my business Co-Create Vitality is like, we, we need to have connection. We need to do this together. It's you creating with source, with God. It's you creating with your the people around you. You know, like you guys have helped me so much, Leslie. You know, I was going through such a rough time and I had at least like someone I could be like, 
blah, <laughs> like, I don't even know where this is, but I just need to, I just need to reflect and mirror with you a little bit, you know, and that's uh, keeping grounding and it can just, yeah, it can bring us back to like, everything's going to be okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the type of kind of presence with another person is that mirroring back to yourself of your own validation, right? And your own value, I think. And I do think that that is also part of this is valuing your own like core self and being curious to discover it, what's unique in you and how you tick. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I love that, you know, really giving yourself space, being curious about yourself, slowing down enough to go inward and and listen deeply. And that's mm -hmm. that something you had mentioned about this deep listening and intuitive um, understanding. You get to a place where you can listen to your own life force and you can hear what it wants, where where you're supposed to go rather than the mind. And that's the another place of overlap that I want to really hone in on is that um, human design and yoga, especially, you know, we can include astrology and in they ask you to drop out of your mind, out of your thinking, right? If you if your mind, if you consider this metaphor, I don't love to use mechanical metaphors for the body, but if the mind were a computer that's programmable, right? We're just been we literally have been programmed and we can take a look is that program serving me is that really who i am or is that just the thinking or me just mirroring what's outside of me over and over again we can just keep coming back to this idea is that really me you are in you are felt sense in your body and if we can drop out of the thinking over and over the thinking is not your authority as we say in human design your authority is in the body and it's a felt sense and everybody feels it differently um but that is a very it's a very um big idea if there were a goal right that's the goal <laughs> yes yes and then what when when one starts to identify what's me what's not me what is my template you know then that i would imagine that that could lead to people feeling like a bit maybe even in a crisis or confused, what, yeah. what then, you know, it's yeah. we people, we need each other for sure at that point. Yeah, I think it's a need to honor, and like you said, value ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, to, mm -hmm. it's nice to be, we all wanna be seen and we all wanna be heard, but really valuing ourselves. And, and it's nice to have community because they can show us our value when we forget. Yeah. You know? But it's also about reverence to really how beautiful and even horrible <laughs> our whole life experience is. There is a full spectrum that we will go through. And what I recognize is that the, the worst that I've ever felt and the deepest places I've ever gone to kind of uproot really hurt and tra traumatic stuff that was stuck in me, I feel like, not only in those moments did I feel the most connected to source, but inevitably I was then able to, the pendulum to swing and I was able to feel like higher highs. Yeah. And so when we find ourselves in those places, it's knowing that it's for a purpose and it's not new age, positive thinking. Don't, you know, Oh, I'm sad. Like just think positively, like that's bypassing. That's avoidance. That is exact opposite of what I stand for and what I want to teach and bring. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a recognizing that it's for a purpose, right? Pluto is wherever it is in your chart, it's going to show you where there might be a lot of change, a lot of death and a lot of rebirth in your life. And it's going to break things down. And <laughs> But it's for the purpose. It's for the purpose of your true soul path for your true right direction. Yes, yes. Mm. Right. Because this process of looking inward can and will most definitely bring up some discomforts and yeah. maybe in a feeling of being lost or confused. And mm -hmm. so that is there's an embracing. Right. Instead of the tendency we often have of running away from that discomfort and medicating or, you know, avoiding. This is really a path of sitting with 
and embracing to some degree. Right? Eric's laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know it's funny. We even avoid hunger, you know. <laughs> hey, if we're gonna avoid that in like all the, you know, avoid all the pain and hurt and you know whatever discomfort, you're breaking the cycle of that true hero's journey, and you ain't gonna yeah. get to the point of you know redemption or redeem. You know, like yeah. in that process, there is like the fall or whatever, and you know, building it up and. We all go through certain conflicts in life. Don't be, no, just kidding. <laughs> there are I really, I really like the, the hero's journey tale. I feel like that's um, a part of our psyche that we, we can't remove. I mean, there's even some talk out there and some studies about how every movie that is produced and put out there goes through that same journey. And if the, the hero doesn't die on this page and this timing in the movie and then come back on this page. Like our psyche doesn't even know what to do with that. We're so used to it so deeply ingrained in us and embedded in us. <laughs> Anything yeah. outside of that, right? They're all B movies because we can't even, like we don't even know what to do. It's not the right, mm -hmm. it's not the right story. <laughs> right, that's an interesting point, yeah. yeah. You, you had early on mentioned something about um, Part of the yoga of being of burning out what's not true what's not us and it reminded me of the alchemical process that yeah. seems to also parallel or, or mirror that what you're talking about any comments yeah. on that very much so um when you say that i think about that process of churning right and metabolizing things this is where the this um idea of my favorite type of meditation might be <laughs> contemplative meditation where we take in an idea and we bring it in and we kind of churn with it and we sit with it and and let that be the focus right and even yes. though it's not the meditation where um you know we're trying to quiet the mind which meditation the thoughts never go away all you all don't have the wrong idea about meditation. The thoughts never go away. They might slow down. <laughs> they might change. But but yeah, that idea. I think when overall though, what I think of when you say that is um, is the the subtle blueprint of our body, which is the subtle energy and the chakras. So we have this base chakras: red, orange, yellow, <laughs> root, sacral, and you know center of our body, ego, belly, and we need to kind of churn and move and and fire burn through some of the stuff that's that's there and the themes of those energy centers survival right sexual relations intimacy um who we are in the world we kind of have to burn some of that away for that flame to come to the heart and here we hit the element of air and then from air, right, we get lighter, we gain, we have a voice and our voice is speaking from the heart. And then we burn some more stuff and we um, see from a higher perspective. And then we share from that perspective. And when we really open ourselves up and it's not like we're, this process isn't happening all the time, but that would be called the liberating current from the ground up, mm -hmm. that kind of alchemical process. And then there's the manifesting current, which is right from, mm -hmm. down. and we, come we have a divine inspiration and we think about it and we contemplate about it and then it comes out and then we bring it into the heart and we can really gain perspective and like where are we coming from what is our motive what's our intention and then we start to bring it out into the world through yeah and root ourselves in our deepest like big connections to earth and how our how we're operating and surviving with our feet on the ground yes grounded so this experience now i want to take a moment just to say like i've been in done a lot of that churning and burning with days and days and days of kundalini yoga and i got so high up and out of my body that for mm -hmm. two years i was just emotional wreck i was like a volcano well, not a volcano in an angry way but just like this not knowing where my energy was not knowing where i was it was like a so messy <laughs> um all for a purpose and when i started to do the practices in the body i truly did a year of crossfit right which is this very heavy resistance in the body to ground myself to begin that process of okay what did i learn and then how can i come really back and if I had not known to find that balance for myself, I would not be here talking to you right now. I would still be 
you know, up here somewhere. Damn, super very <laughs> fairy, yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you a question because this actually came to mind a couple weeks ago or something like that in regards to, yeah, like you really sparked that idea when talking about the, you know, the flaming energies of the, you know, fiery belly from within, you know, rising to the heart chakra from the solar plexus and uh, mm -hmm. is, you know, with that whole I am identity and stuff, mm -hmm. know, that might be more of the sacral, but, you know, at the same time, like, there is a purpose that, you know, it's like the umbilical cord, our belly button, that's like right there in the center of that. What's the significance of that, you think? I'm so glad you're asking that, and I'm seeing a belly button now in your mandala. <laughs> <laughs> Patterns. <laughs> um, yes, awesome. in, in Kundalini Yoga especially, they really talk a lot about the navel center mm. and um, the subtle body anatomy in yoga where our prana runs through our life force energy, this more, this most subtle would be called nadis, right? Subtle energy channels running through the body, hundreds of them, thousands of them, 177 or 77,000 of them meet right there at the navel center. So in, if you see the Kundalini yogis doing right? Breath of fire, pumping the navel over and over and over and over. It's like a clearing for your, your ancestral line. It's what was connected previously to the person before, previously to the person before, right? Mm -hmm. It's that area of connection. And I really related to that when it was, um, when it was talked about because that's part of that breaking away and becoming our, our, a sovereign being on our own, right? And so the navel work, there's a direct connection from the third chakra, Manipura, to the third eye, the Ajna center. And as we work on your core, as you work on your sense of self, and yes, it can be a very physical way to do it, is very effective, right? You start to, this is what wakes up your consciousness. But how many people do we see all around us that have no sense of their own core? <laughs> no sense of like their belly or like, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, that, that's really cool. Um, Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It seems intuitively, Derek, like you recognize how powerful that is, yeah. And it makes sense because that's where we're connected to our mother, right? In utero, the connection to the mother. And when, and that's also seems, is, would you say that yoga is, is sort of a feminine, is, is, is a feminine art or practice more so, or is it a balance of masculine and feminine practices? That's an interesting contemplation. And I think I want to answer it in a couple different ways. So when we, balance the masculine and feminine within ourselves, right? We can, we have both of those energies. It's not a gender thing, but an energetic thing. The um, yin and the uh, and yang, the left feminine and right masculine, even just bringing the palms together is kind of an honor to that, right? Mm -hmm. But as we breathe, there's a breath work called alternate nostril breathing, where you're breathing through the left nostril and kind of stimulating that lunar, feminine, passive, side of you and then balancing also the solar the active the masculine side mm -hmm. and so that's a really nice practice to bring that balance and yoga right yoga there's this like word yoga <laughs> that we think we know what it is <laughs> and we see lots of pictures of it and we think oh yes that's yoga but one of my favorite things to remind people of is like you know, I do a lot of movement yoga and then we stop and we be still. And um, I, I just say, you know, the yoga is still happening in this moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yoga is still happening right now. So there is a very much a balance of masculine, active and, you know, passive. And they they refer to in yoga teacher trainings as stira and sukha, which is like the steadiness in a pose, but at that, but at the same time, the ease of the pose. Mm, yes. And yeah. how can we find both? 
Yes, sort of the release and the receptive aspect and also the directed, you know, very linear kind of proper way of doing a pose, for example, you know. Yeah, and, and not even just proper. It's like when we align the body in a certain way, which of course is going to mean the bones, which of course is going to mean the fascia, because that's what keeps our bones connected. When we align in a certain way, our prana can then move freely. And that's what the idea is. So we make a different shape to activate, right, a different type of energy in our bodies. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you had talked about this science, the sovereign science, and this process of, of self-observation and possibly doing some little um, experiments with oneself to learn about what works for our individual um, template. And then there's so much complexity. There's so many options within the yoga tradition in, in terms of like, it's like so diagnosis and then prescription almost. And that mm -hmm. seems very complex. So can you share a little bit more about, you know, this way of approaching yoga versus maybe what's going on typically? And yeah. Can, yeah. So I will get to the physical practice in a second, but maybe we can go in this direction too. And what you are reminding me of is more of what we were talking about a little bit before, which is about if we don't know where to start in our lives, and we don't even have a yoga practice, <laughs> but you know, we can be doing yoga doing by doing doing anything. But let's say what feels sticky in your life? Where is the friction showing up? What feels painful still? What feels difficult? What feels hard? Um, and then looking to those places. So I, I've dubbed myself the shadow work queen. Awesome. <laughs> I, do, I do the hard work because that's where I've recognized in the experiments that I have the most change and I become softer and I become more loving and I become more compassionate and more myself is like going into the, the, the hardest places, the darkest places, the places of trauma, the places that keep showing up over and over. And, you know, um, the architect of the archetype of Chiron in our astrology chart, Chiron is the wounded healer, which is a num another kind of story or maybe archetype we know of. And the reason why Chiron is the wounded healer in mythology is because he was accidentally um, stuck with an arrow and couldn't find a cure, was in pain and searched and became this healer of herbs and this, this amazing knowledgeable person that anybody could come to as a healer, searching for all the remedies, learning all the things, but couldn't heal himself. So what that shows us is that like the medicine is in the wound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's exactly what Chiron will mm -hmm. point to in your natal chart is your deepest wounds, right? And it could, depending on what house it's in, depending on what sign it is, it's just gonna give you an, a pointer, like, hey, I could look here. Right? I could look there. Am I having issues in that? Is that, oh, wait, I was totally avoiding that. That is the hardest thing for me. And this is how it's showing up. So that's how we can kind of use the, the visual of a natal chart or the visual of human design to kind of point to mm -hmm. a little bit of shadow and then contemplate, oh, how is that showing up in my life? So, yes, yes. And, oh, yeah. and I will go ahead. Oh, I was going to go on. If you want to talk about that, we can. But uh, onto the physical yoga piece is, you know, yoga, that word again, <laughs> it means so many different things. And there's so many different types of yoga that are outlined in classical yoga philosophy, right? There, you can be a bhakti yogi, you can be a devotional yogi. That's definitely where I, I see myself. You can be a jnana yogi, which is like just studying the knowledge. You can be a karmic yogi where your actions are that austerity or that kind of burning through your karma. You're just devoting everything you do in the hand to God all day and whatever it is you do, even in your work and raising children and whatnot. Um, and you, there's these, these different types of yoga. And then there's, well, where did the physical practice of yoga come from? And really it developed out of 
people being uncomfortable when they sit down in their bodies. So then, okay, you do a little stretch, right? Oh, okay, now we open up the hips and now I can sit longer. I can sit better to kind of get into that space of connection and uh, truth, right? Where things are, we're not being distracted and there's not all kinds of stories and Maya or the illusion that's feeding our minds, <laughs> but we're sitting with the truth of things. And then it started off, well, then of course, it's gonna develop into teachers. Well, the lineage that I, have found myself in my first training is from the lineage of Krishnamacharya. And he lived in the early 1900s. What I love about him is that he taught individuals. He didn't teach group classes because yoga, that prescription that you mentioned, is going to be different for each person at their point in their life, the season of their life, what they've been through. Like, it's going to be different for everyone. So to have this kind of blanket yoga class, I can see why, even though it's frustrating, it has turned into um, a blanket yoga class of, of exercise for people. I can see how that progression works in this modern sense. And, and it does have benefits. Any of us moving in our bodies and breathing, right? It does have benefits. But it's also about like, where is the teacher guiding you? Is the teacher guiding you to look through the lens of yoga or is the teacher guiding you to go deeper or uh, bind underneath your arm when you're, when you're not even in alignment where the prana can't even flow? You can't even breathe, but you should get to this pose because this is where we're supposed to go. So there's like all of this, <laughs> all of this, it's ego, it's really, it's ego base. So from Krishna, from Krishnamacharya, this is kind of important to know about yoga history, two very important, three very important teachers came out of Krishnamacharya. BKS Iyengar of Iyengar Yoga, which is very well known in the West, and then Sri Patabi Joy with Ashtanga Yoga. And they both came from the same teacher. I wonder why they show up so differently because they're different people. They were taught in different ways. They, everybody needs a little bit of a different teacher and Krishnamacharya really knew this. Um, so then we have this Ashatanga, which is you do these poses in this order the same way every single time. Or there's Iyengar where you are not flowing at all. You do the pose, you let the breath be whatever it is. Ashatanga, very controlled breath. Iyengar, breath is what it is. We put our body into a position and we let the natural energy flow, right? Very different ideas. They all came from the same teacher. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. And I think you've also evolved in your own, you know, practice and individualizing mm -hmm. the physical practice of yoga too. You know, I'd like to hear more about what, where your practice has gone. Yes, I have done those types of yoga. The third type of yoga that came out of Krishnamacharya was from his son, which is known as Vini Yoga. And Vini Yoga is much more introspective and it is this still this idea of moving, connecting the breath and movement together because that's going to give the mind a place to focus. And then we're not in the past, we're not in the future, we're not in the world. It's connecting that life force in the body by moving the body with the breath simultaneously. And this is a wonderful meditative practice. Um, I've taken so much from all three of these lineages. And then from, right, this is more from Southern India. From Northern India comes this idea of um, Kundalini yoga and a more tantric view of yoga where the subtle body is of focus. We're still working in the physical body, but the subtle body comes more into focus as working directly with the energy centers or directly with what they call our psychic glands right? Mm -hmm. The pituitary gland, the pineal gland are higher faculties. And like, I, I always come back to this kind of like, think of it as like the base of a pyramid. There's the physical piece, the mental piece, the emotional piece, and the spiritual. And if we can do a little bit of work in each of those base, the foundation, right, to get us to wherever we think we need to go <laughs> at the top, um, yeah, a little bit touching into all those. So I feel like that's what I've drawn from. It's like, I love the physical aspect of yoga. I, I love um, 
<laughs> contemplating where what what are emotions and do they need to be there or not and, and dealing with my own emotions i'm an emotional being it says so right right in my human design chart which i just already knew about myself <laughs> and then the um energetic piece right that's the emotion and then the mental piece like can i develop that observer quality where i'm seeing my thoughts i'm taking a step back realizing that the thoughts are still going but i'm back here mm -hmm. And then, and then the spiritual aspect and, and Kundalini yoga touches a lot on the kind of devotional or the bhakti, the bhakti aspect of what are we devoting our energy to and what is our higher belief system? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That seems very important to ask. What are we devoting our energy to? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Also, as far as like people, you know, looking to get into yoga and, you know, potential students, you know, it depends sometimes, you know, like they might have, you know, the wrong idea or over expectations and all this stuff. And that can kind of ruin like the moment to moment experience. And I'm kind of curious as far as, you know, you being a teacher and, you know, with the students and obs observations that you've seen, what are people struggling with uh, as far as I like, grasp and whether the concepts uh, mentally, emotionally, metaphysically or just like yeah. physically, it, what's hard for them to follow, I guess. I think that this term you've probably heard it before, monkey mind shows up. Yeah. <laughs> it shows up with like the mind bouncing in the past and the future, anywhere to avoid the present <laughs> and the present and what's what you're feeling right then in that moment. Because what's always present with you is always your body and always your breath, right? So you'll see people just like all over the place, you know, because they're not, you know, that you say right leg, they lift the left. I used to do this stuff all the time. <laughs> So there's that aspect of the monkey mind jumping around. And then there's the monkey see, monkey do. Mm. Oh, I want to do that pose. Yeah. I saw something and I want to do that. Rather than having it be like a like an internal, like, I want to feel a certain way. <laughs> I want the relationships in my life to feel smoother. I want to develop a more quality of self-love. And I think that people don't really have a, they might have touched in on some of these, like, joy and bliss and like self-love and really feeling deep connection at times, but they don't really have a basis for it to even con con contrast or compare, you know, they don't know what they're looking for. They just want to feel better. So movement and breath and exercise is, is where I meet people, right? They're coming in and I, I just meet people where they're at. And then I sprinkle in a little, a little philosophy, like, you know yeah why are, why are you here today <laughs> yeah develop some awareness yeah it highlights that external versus internal focus you know where generally people are focusing externally looking at you know someone doing this fancy pose and wanting to be like that and that develops a competitiveness do you yeah. see that competitiveness in the yoga community it's everywhere i mean every you know um successful Instagram yogi you see is doing big poses. And that's not necessary. It's not, it's not, it's not necessarily yoga. It's, it's yeah. beautiful. I love long lines. I grew up as a ballerina. Like I love the long lines. I love the aesthetic of it. I just know that just because you can do a deep back bend doesn't mean your heart's open. Yeah. <laughs> it, it brings up the, idea that I think some people maybe with physical disabilities or people who are aging and you know you know not as spry or flexible may say well I can't do yoga right yeah. and so that's a fallacy it is it's another place that our ego shows up to make us small this time instead of too big it shows up and it makes us small like I can't do that and um yeah I've heard I've gosh I've heard that so many times you know and it's like, well, if you're not flexible, <laughs> I don't, it, that's right. That seems to be everybody's goal. I need, I want longer hamstrings. I want to be flexible. Um, well then maybe do like work towards that. <laughs> so I just, then just stay you're gonna go into the wound, right? You're going to go into the place that is uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, the, another type of yoga that I do that feels more accessible for people Kundalini is very demanding physically. There are more meditative practices, absolutely. Um, 
uh, but I work more with the fascia and this idea of our connective tissue and not just a muscular or, or uh, visual practice, but that we really um, develop the qualities of our the tissue, the one tissue that connects every piece of our body, every from the eyes <laughs> to the skin, layers of the skin to uh, tendons and ligaments are all fascia. It separates every organ, it separates every muscle, every muscle fiber even is all encased in this fascia of different textures, the thickest being the Achilles and the plantar fascia of the foot. Mm -hmm. But these are pathways of communication in the body. And when we don't move in a variety of ways. We get stuck. Our, our connective tissue, that's a crystalline structure. It's like a helix type of structure. It gets very rigid and it doesn't move. But if you do repetitive movements and you get that glide going, you get that hydration, they call it, in between the tissues. There's hyaluronic acid in between the tissues. You get the glide going. And then you free up your range of motion and your mobility, but it frees up your um, the receptors that are in the fascia so you have a deeper sense of proprioception where your body is in space and then you have a deeper sense of interoception which again there's like that's where i really find that my gift is is feeling sensing inside the body 50 percent of the receptors that we have in our body are for feather light touch or less but everybody wants that deep tissue massage <laughs> So this type of yoga, I feel, is it's slower, it's more methodical, um, it brings a really nice wave of calm over you, it drops you right into your parasympathetic nervous system because some of the receptors that we're working with directly in the fascial tissue, they're called the Ruffini endings, they regulate your autonomic nervous system. Mm. It's, a, it's a felt sense, it feels different than other yoga. And because it's more accessible, um, I think there's a yoga out there for everyone. I do. I yes. really, think, yeah, I love the, I love the, I just call it now the, like the fascial focus. I focus on the fascia. Yes. Do you see a connection between um, a rigid body and a rigid mind? You know, can you increase well, flexibility yes. in one by working on the other? Yeah. Um, yes from just me seeing patterns and reading people's bodies, really, that's what I do now for the past 12 years. I see people, how they move and, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes how they think, and there can be a, a lot of rigidity in the mind. And that often translates to, yes, often translates. Not always though. I, I can't fully subscribe to this. Mm -hmm. um, it's not black and white or whatever, right? Yeah, it's really not. You know, it, it will show up in different it ways. Right? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking of someone right now who is um, very open in their tissues, right? Not doesn't have a lot of stability, but the rigidity of the mind is there mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. in a, you know? mm -hmm. So that just shows me that. The pro like the programs are embedded. So they're called samskaras in yoga. You can think of drawing a stick from like say like a little creek. If you were to kind of carve out and the water starts to flow, the deeper you carve, the more times you think that same thought, the more time you do that same pattern, the more water is going to flow that way. Yes. Yes. Samskaras. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So that's a tough one. <laughs> I like that. And, and just, you know, the whole idea of, you know, stretching and yeah, your body might be, it's getting out of the comfort zone or whatever, you know, like extending and all that stuff. And you can correlate this to the mind as well. And as far as like shadow work is concerned of like getting uncomfortable, like, Ooh, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally in that, in that same, in that same way, it's like sitting in that discomfort a bit. You know, yeah. um, the other thing about the fascia real quick is that the first time I took this very particular class, this fascia yoga, or they call it myofascial yoga, was um, I had been on vacation. I'd been riding around in a truck and like being pretty more sedentary, sedentary than I usually am. I took this class and I was so clear. I was so clear for the next 24 hours. I was like, wow, I've never experienced that in this 
like grounded way. I've experienced it in the like, let's do a bunch of breath work and, and get ourselves high way. <laughs> and great, everything, you know, seems great. But this was a different sensation. It was a grounded sense. And so I've, I did you know, doing these experiments, like this is the type of uh, yoga that that does, I really see that connection between opening those pathways because it's our, our nervous system is embedded inside the fascia. It holds all of our, all of our systems of the body. So when we work with that, it clears that communication, the two types, right? From the, the CEO, from the brain, the physical like working brain, not even just the mind to the body and from the body to the back up yes. to the brain. It just really clears those channels. Yeah. You know, there's something that, you know, I've learned partly from you and I've heard from other places because I've, I had like, um, you know, hip surgeries. I had arthritis in my hips. Mm -hmm. I was super tight and like my mobility was very restricted. I had surgery and I've been, you know, building back my mobility, but still frustrated a bit with that. And what, um, what I've gathered is that it's not just about stretching, right? It's not just about, you know, length, and, you know, we, there's an aspect of also um, muscle building or, you know, you, you know, that, that, and also the bouncing. So can you explain a little <laughs> bit about that, right? Yeah. So the, about the, the, it's the stability, I think that, that um, gets overlooked a lot in regular yoga practices. Not that we're not building strength we are but there are smaller muscles closer to the bones known as the stability muscles and when we're just working the larger muscle groups right we don't necessarily have the um, awareness of really how to place our bones and the stability muscles help us place our bones in a specific way so like for in, in for instance in the hips we're not grinding the femur bone into the hip socket, right? That's when we keep making the same repetitive motion over and over and then you have no cartilage left, that's when the hip socket will need to be replaced. So there's particular things that we can do to um, strengthen and stabilize from the inside, from that foundation, right? The bones, the structure, and then extend out from there, right? And then learn some bigger movement patterns. So that's the one thing I love about the lit yoga that I share with you. It's L Y T lit yoga. And it's, uh, it starts from the center, always yeah. from the deep core, from that connection to yourself, from the third chakra, it's like, there you are. And now let's start, we'll, we'll progressively move in bigger movement patterns. Yes, it's methodical. And there is a science to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, that's why I think that, you know, to fully answer your question from earlier, that's where I've been drawn to is like, where does the sports science overlap now with the yoga practice? And what can we glean from that? Mm -hmm. And what can we, where do those, where does it overlap where our practice becomes safer and more sustainable over a long period of time? Because we can do those forward sitting forward folds over and over and over again until you know for 50 years but we're going to lose all of the stability of the layers and layers and layers of connective tissue in our sacrum and our low back we're probably going to have back issues <laughs> we can sit and do forward folds all day to lengthen our hamstrings to stretch our hamstrings but you're not going to be able to run very well because you need that natural tension you need that pro the hamstrings propel us forward Right. So there's this natural tension in the body that in yoga, we get this idea that like, I need to be longer. I need to stretch. I need to become a contortionist or a ballerina. And like, let me tell you, that is not the healthiest thing for the body. Mm -hmm. It's about keeping some tension to be able to move well and move in any direction we want to move in. I only do yoga so I can dance. <laughs> right. So what are the, what are the very physical, um, you know, risks of, overdoing the stretching yoga, you know, the same routine over and over again, what can happen to the body? Well, repetitive stress injury is a term that's been used in the sports science world is when you're doing that same, <clears throat> that same motion over and over. The most common repetitive stress injury in yoga is going to be at the rotator cuff because you're asked to go in that vinyasa flow, right? From high plank to low plank. Men 
are, are tech, are, you know, usually are a bit stronger in the upper body and they might not be as affected, but many women are just not, you don't have that natural build and the shoulder starts to tip forward. Usually it's an imbalance. It's often one side, but you're starting to pull then on these tendons connected to the muscles of the rotator cuff, four of them, that three of them wrap around the front of the humerus here. And the more you do that, the more you're going to micro tears, little tears over and over and over again, until you learn to put the bones in the right place and lower down. Yeah. That includes downward dog position too, right? All that. Yeah. That's part that's part of that vinyasa. Yeah. You go from high plank to low plank to a little back bend of some sort, and then, um, to downward dog. Mm. Yeah. So there's, there's places in there. And the other most common injury is, um, another pulling on a tendon. It's the insertion of the hamstring way up high at the top of the femur bone right below the, like underneath the buttocks basically. And <laughs> when, you pull on that, say in triangle pose, it's a pose I don't even really teach anymore, like once in a while I will in a very specific way, because the way that the hips are angled and the whole thing, it pulls on that biceps femoris tendon. And I have this injury from going into this pose so deep. So there's this thing that we start to develop when we start to move in our body that the sensation is good for me. And that is, a, that is not necessarily true. That sensation that you might be feeling in the moment is the next day could be super painful inflammation because you've done that micro tear to a tendon or to a ligament. And, and we just kind of keep going for that sensation. I've done it myself. I'm like, oh, the sensation, it feels so good in the moment. And then I'm wrecked for a week. So that's that's what happens when we don't develop that like internal awareness and we we're focusing more on the outside as we we don't know we start to not know the difference between those subtleties yeah. damn <clears throat> speaking of focusing on the outside yeah what's the deal with you know some of the you know spiritual fashion shows going on with you know these grandiose so you know yoga poses that are really hard for the you know even like the intermediate person to do and let alone you know factor in, in all these you know health issues that could occur in the mm -hmm. future especially if it's a repetitive thing and all this jazz and so yeah just kind of bringing it back to you know i've noticed there are people that you know want to cling on to anything as far as you know outside of the mainstream and whatever mystical spiritual all that and uh that's not to downplay any of that. It just seems that sometimes people have this approach like they're going to have, you know, just like they just want it for like the ego identification thing and not really truly, you know, integrate the proper principles and teachings to just better their lives and others around them type of thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of um, a lot of motivation is driven by our ideas, people's idea of success. Right. If I do, I, they, they do the experiment, right? I, if I do this pose, if I put out a picture in this way, I get more likes. Therefore, I get more dopamine hits. Therefore, I get, <laughs> right? it, it might start to become a little addictive. Um, yeah, really checking, checking ourselves. When, I mean, it's, it shows up in different ways, but in that, that kind of big pose, like showy way, I mean, that's what gets the attention. And if you want to build a business, sometimes business coaches will even say to you, oh, well, you do the things that get the attention. Don't be authentic. Be authentic after you do the things that get people's attention. And I would say that Instagram being a very, um, you know, and it started off as a, an image, a picture based share, right? You're sharing pictures. And I totally get how that can misconstrue into that because people like to look at nice things. I think we all have a, you know, a, ease on the eyes right <laughs> so it's pretty complicated uh to get into but but a lot of that can be very um ego driven and it just we just keep doing the same thing because it's what it, it's what feeds that kind of dopamine hit and that's yeah. like and i think it also creates more division between the kind of experts and the advanced yogis from the, the average person that may feel that that's unattainable, yes. you know, and that that's the goal even, 
you yeah. know, to achieve. And I think what you're really saying is that's not, you know, doing some fancy, difficult pose isn't the goal. Yeah. The most advanced yogis I know aren't even on any social media or, or just or barely, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's an advanced yogi. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a way to, you know, also like remind people to come back again to themselves and set their own goals and markers based on their own where you start, right? Because we mm -hmm. are all starting from different places. And that's why I think that learning even just basic human design or astrology about yourself, say your top three, right? Sun, moon, rising, or in human design, you learn what energy type you are. Mm -hmm. And you can start with that. You know, I um, can use myself as, as an example for a couple of reasons. One, because the only defined gate I have in my throat is the gate 16, which is talks about skills. And uh, it's also about enthusiasm. It leads to the channel of mastery, but it's, I can only speak from my experience. If I sit here and I say to you, I believe, or I, you know, like it's not heard. I have an energetic that I'm working with. And like, this is how I've done the experiments. If I frame things in this way, right? I've mastered these skills. I've had this experience. I'm received, I'm heard. Mm -hmm. So in human design, I'm a generator. And a generator has their sacral center defined. It's a picture you would see on your chart if you were to see it. Um, Leslie has it too. <laughs> and this is our center of response. Mm -hmm. And first of all, it means that I have consistent energy. It's like the battery of the body, just like the Dantian in Chinese medicine or the sacral center. This is like where we hold and can store energy. And I, I get up every day and I, I do the things, I, t I tire out the battery drains, I go to bed and I do it all again. <laughs> Not everybody has this consistent access, right? Everybody has a different energy type. And even just knowing your energy type, you can start to work with kind of shaping your life and doing the experiments and like, oh, does that work better for me? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Do you want to know your energy type? <laughs> Derek has energi energizer bunny type. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got too much uh, fire to burn with the wind behind it and all that jazz, <laughs> including the sun, moon, and, and rising. So, yeah, it's, uh, it ain't so surprising, but anyways. <laughs> yeah. So it, just working with the basics um, of, of just knowing a few things. So everything about that sacral center for energy types who are generators or manifesting generators, you can there's many calculators out there. You can go, just go put in your birth date and your time and your place and find your human design. Um, it's about responding to life. It's all about that gut feeling, which may show up not just in the gut, right? It could be a tingle in your cheeks. It could be every person feels their uh, this type place of intuition a little bit differently, but it's about responding to life. Like when I stopped the idea, we're all programmed like manifestors, go out and get it, make it happen, start the things. When I stopped those tapes playing in my head and got back to like, I'm here to enjoy things. I'm here to spread that energy and that joy because that is part of the, the generator um, archetype. I'm here to respond to life. And I stopped thinking I had to go out and do. And now I just honestly, five years, four years into this experiment, I just sit back and wait for things and everything I need comes. I don't have to have, there's, what happened is I dropped out of the worry that anxiety, that mental tension is like, I just dropped out of the worry and I, it didn't happen overnight, but I just kept doing the experiments. What happens if I wake up in the morning and I don't get up and do the things I have to do? I lay there and ask my body, ask my life force, what do you feel like doing right now? Yeah. And then it, and then it tells me, and it might be lay in bed for another two hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know? very different way of approaching our, our daily tasks. Yes. Yeah. Things will change. Yeah. <laughs> Can you go ahead and, and just share in a brief way, like the different human designs, you know, the general categories and energy type? Sure. Yeah, because yeah. I do think it's a super important point you're making about, you know, we we see someone 
who operates a certain way and they say, do this, do this. This is the way you need to do it. But that's not the way everybody's designed to do it. Yeah. You know? So how do we need to go figure out what we're kind doing? Of the, kind of the same way in yoga, right? It's mm -hmm. like the teacher who, who says, guide you to yourself rather than the teacher that just guides the whole class yeah. or like the business coach that says, this is what you need to do, right? Our individual energy is gonna make that a bit different. So there's generators. Generators are the, and this includes manifesting generators because they just have a little bit of a different energy, but this is about 70% of people. We are the builders. We're the, we are the, the, the actual energy that it takes to get things done, to build foundations and things like that's that type of energy. For people without sacral centers, which is be projectors, would be the next maybe like 25 or so, maybe a little bit more percent of the population. They have an undefined, open, not open, but undefined sacral center. They don't have consistent energy to use. Whenever we have an open place in, um, in our chart, we're taking in the energy from the people around us. So projectors are going to take in that sacral energy and they're going to expand it outward. And so projectors are known for <laughs> not working. <laughs> I'm not even joking. It makes me laugh every time I say it. Projectors are not here to work. They're here to uh, be interested in what they're interested in, to cultivate that, to build that. And then we call them in as kind of like, you know, overseers or, or way showers or guiders, we call the projectors in to help guide our sacral energy because they see so well into people. Like generators see themselves really well. Projectors are not very good at seeing themselves, but they're great at seeing into uh, situations or into other people. They're great at strategizing, creating like structure. <laughs> yeah, I see that my son. Yeah, it's a different energy, right? Yes. For some, the projectors I know, they don't necessarily get up in the morning. <laughs> They're not like, they are the, the, the least of the morning people. <laughs> so the next category um, would be manifestors. And they're about 8 or 9% of the population. Uh, they off, also do not have a defined sacral center. Uh, uh, manifestors are known as the ancient kings and queens. They kind of have that that this is no hierarchy whatsoever, but I'm just kind of like, they're, they're the leaders in a sense where they're really good at directing people, seeing what needs to be done, but in a bigger way. And manifestors are here to go out and get it. They are that initiating energy. They can, I mean, my partner is a manifestor. I just see him just directing, right? He, for most of the day, often, unless he has to, I mean, obviously they're gonna work. He's more comfortable in 80% of his time being restful or doing something he loves to do. And 20% of the time, full on work, full on energy. And in that 80%, he's just, he's resting and then gaining energy to do that next big thing. And that's kind of the way that manifestors work. And then the last category would be a reflector. And a reflector is only 1% of the population and they have no defined centers whatsoever. Um, oh yeah, I'll just say quickly, the manifestor's energy is, is, is centered around the throat. They mm -hmm. are the physical manifestors. They speak and it comes into existence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reflectors have no definition. And that no definition, what that does for us, it'd be ideal if every community had a reflector because they are um, like mirrors. They ref they're barometer for the health of the community and the health of the environment that they're in and the people around them because they're taking in energy in every area, all the themes, all the areas, they're taking it in and expanding it out. So depending on what they're around, they can be very clear mirrors for us to see what's going on. Yeah. So a community that has a good, you know, balance of these different designs really is a stronger community. And we, yeah. we really do need each other's strengths and yeah. um, can work together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and allow ourselves to um, allow other people to be in their strengths too. Yeah. You know, yeah. we all want to be the leader. Well, that's probably not going to work. 
And it, and it also, it, it takes away the judgment, say, of someone who has a design that's more, that appears to be less go-getter like, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think our culture, our society has this very strict, you know, definition of what is productivity, what is, you know, success. People, yeah. I talked to a lot of people who feel very guilty when they are in downtime. And um, if they're not feeling productive in the kind of mainstream way, you know, there, there's a sense of something, I'm not being um, a good person, I'm not productive, I need to change. And, and, I, and this whole conversation about design makes me think of things very differently. And this nine to five, 40 hour work week, this external kind of production mentality mm -hmm. is very, uh, it's almost like anti-human. It, it's yeah. taking us out of, our actual true design and um, keeps us from really knowing ourself and, and expressing our full potentials. And there's a lot of, um, it's the it's guilt that comes up when we're resting, when we're giving ourselves that space, right? To know ourselves, mm -hmm. space to feel, what is my next move? What do I really wanna do? Yeah, it's guilt that comes up and I've dealt a lot with that. And also from growing up Catholic, right? There's a lot of that imprinting, <laughs> like you should feel guilty about these things, especially when it comes to rest. And then, you know, the nine to five working is that generators, we have in manifesting generators, we have the energy to do that, right? We have the energy to get up and do the things and do the work every day. Work is not the issue. But what we're here for is to do most of us, right? There's a couple channels and people, and I'm not going to get into details that uh, have a more evolutionary push which is challenging for them but generally we need to do what lights us up because if everyone is if all the people who are undefined are taking in our energy and amplifying it they're going to take in whatever energy we show up with so if we do what brings us joy we really dig into and spend our time doing what lights us up we're changing the we're changing the attitude of the whole thing. If we're going to the nine to five and we're miserable, well, that's what we'll have to offer. Yes, so, yes. If you yes. tap into this and start experimenting, some big changes can happen. It's 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 a challenge, but I I I'm seeing the rewards and the benefits and um, the people around me too. I've given a lot of readings now, and it's just it brings me a lot of joy to help people find their purpose in this phase. Yes, very very cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Real quick, think about your question, Leslie, whatever, but uh, <clears throat> it reminds me of them good old Paris days when, you know, I took the Metro for about a good couple years and just seeing all the long faces, you know, yeah, I went to work at, with all the people, you know, from morning to sunset, whatever, but I was like grooving in my headphones, like, what? why all the long faces, man? This is life, you know, enjoy that shit. What the hell? You know, just, <laughs> What else are you going to do, man? Mope around for well, fucking what? But uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's good. I love that attitude. <laughs> yeah. Good and there, there's a certain courage, really, that um, this this takes to, when, when we discover our design to then take action to um, bring our life, external life and our lifestyle into congruence mm -hmm. with that. And I think that that's really essential, you know, part of this um, clearing out that which doesn't serve us, which isn't, tr you know, true, is going to mean disconnecting and maybe making big lifestyle choices. And when we do that, and we can connect in with principle-based living as well, you know, the natural law principles, yeah. then we have, like, I think, a great power and momentum um, to work together and create, like, a much more healthy society yeah i think the principle of the still society what <laughs> the principle, living yeah, by the principles is i end with the uh, cavalia with you know regarding you know the science of sovereignty um, what i like to also call the science of life as far as like mm -hmm. natural law cosmic law karmic law and all these things that intertwine with you know so yeah I'll let you, you know, unwind and, you know, rewind. We talked about <laughs> earlier, but yeah, cheers. Yeah, the sovereignty piece. We're all so unique and wonderful and beautiful, and we should um, allow ourselves to to be our 
our unique design and not think that we need to dress like the next person or act like the next person. Um, yeah. Maybe and and we, you started to say something about the principles, um, you know, and, you know, principles are indicate first things, things that are true, things that are uh, always there that we can turn to. How does this concept of principle um, operate within what you've learned? Right. So where I'm drawn to with that question is um, if we are not all on the same set of principles that we've agreed to, mm -hmm. where does that morality come from? Mm -hmm. And I think it comes from inside, internally. And if we are able to deeply listen, we know right from wrong. But if we don't leave ourselves any space, if we're constantly distracted and there's so much information and I am an information whore, like I trust me, but I also then leave time and space to unwind from that and check myself. Is that what I really believe? Is that what I think? Is that resonate true with me and my experiences? Or am I just mm -hmm. naively kind of taking it on as yeah. that's right, right? There's a lot of woke agenda out there that doesn't, I don't really get <laughs> this people following people and they, they want to belong to something and um, mm -hmm. they want to be unique. And I love that idea of being unique, but, but what are they really following? And I'm not sure that everybody knows. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's this, this idea that I've been contemplating a lot about the, this bridge between the subjective and the objective. And I think that this conversation today is bringing up these two things, the subjective of, of going within, connecting in with your perceptions, your experience, your inner knowing, and yet also seeing uh, that there are um, patterns, that there are truths that you tap into, you know, even just in the simple operation of our body. Yeah. So I think of that as developing our objective sense because as we lift our consciousness up and we can see a bigger picture we can see a broader thing happening than just looking at the bark of the tree we see the forest right we have that ability to be objective and because i keep drawing everything back to the the personal and the you know the the inward it's like then we have the space to be objective about our own emotions it's like oh it's coming up again Yes. Okay. And you don't have to believe that what your emotion says is true, right? Yes. Because you're able to see it, the, the forest for the trees. Yeah. Yeah. I, very many times, it, because I've developed this quality of a, objective witnessing myself, I recognize that I feel a certain way. And then I, I just, I attach a story to it. And I guarantee that I know the story was from the past. It was a similar feeling of hurt or whatever I was going through. I'm just attaching a story to it. What that does, it just gives the mind more fuel to then fuel the same emotional chemical response, <laughs> right? Hormonal response, the whole Negative thing. Negative feedback loops, if it was a bad yeah. thing or whatever, right? Yeah. So if I take, if I drop the story and just feel the feel, a whole different experience you're able to move through it more quickly and see it for what it is which is just an experience that will also like this too shall pass yeah so the That's observe the observer nature is really important to be able to see be with and offer like love even to those you know discomforts yeah. you know is part of is an important part of the ability to uh, I guess, transcend it at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Because the, the light, yeah, it's like shining the light of awareness into those places, like opens it up. You can yes. see, you can see. Yeah. As opposed to, if you don't see it, it'll still operate, but unconsciously in a sense. And so then you're entering into the interaction to, the outside world from an unconscious place that you haven't fully witnessed or felt. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and all and and your specialty and in, in you know um, working with this stuff with people and, and the way that they're relating to things in their life and the way they're relating to their own emotions, like everything we just talked about, 
my book is all tattered because I've had it for so long. It's all in the yoga sutras, really. It's like the number one, chitta vritti, or number two, chitta vritti nirodaha. It's like lessening the fluctuations of the mind. Mm -hmm. Coming to a place, you know, you have to lessen the all the the movement mm -hmm. to kind of settle into a, a place where you can have a different perspective. Yeah. 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 Or that true mind control, you know. We're not controlling our own minds. We're susceptible to other things controlling it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that is a big part of yoga is maintaining or developing that internal vision, that recognizing the mind control, right? That mm -hmm. part of separating out what's me, what's not me, what's true, what's not true. And so much of that wisdom can be found by you know, not just being in the head, but also noticing how the body is expressing and like those stuck patterns, you know, maybe of like holding tension in um, your shoulders or your hips. And, you know, because there's, you know, likely an emotional or other type of a mental experience that led to that tightening, right? Yeah, I mean, I do refer to, and especially with people that I work with, I do refer to often Louise Hay's uh, work of, um, you know, she will take any symptom or, or, or ailment that's showing up in the body. And what she did back in the 60s after curing her own cervical cancer is she sees or had got intuitive sense of the um, mental patterning around that dis-ease in the body and then a positive affirmation to offset that. Now there's all kinds of information about um, affirmations out there and if they work or if they don't work, but if we really sink into um, what the affirmation is saying and spend time with that, not just read it, not just surfacely read it, but like bring it in. Yeah, I, I know that there's some stuff to work with there, some contemplative meditation that can be very beneficial for people. And it reminds me of your interview with the German New Medicine. New medicine. Yeah. yeah, I feel like that's kind of the same body of work in a, in a sense, because you look up, you go to look up on their website like this ailment and it will give the kind of mental thing that could be happening, mental, emotional piece to it. Yeah, and then the science of mind with Ernest Holmes kind of connects in as well. I think that Louis, Louise Hay was influenced mm -hmm. a bit by that as well. And mm -hmm. but it, it's really goes so beyond the kind of superficial idea of manifestation, where you just you know think a thought and or have a feeling, and, and magically things will align to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Manifestation through the lens of human design is also interesting. Those manifestors with all that throw energy, they can speak it out loud and it will start to show up in their life. I do the experiments out there, manifestors. <laughs> yeah. Is Generally, that what to do with the power that then influences the people around them, so to speak? Do you think partly? Does it have to do with the power of the influence of their voice of the people around them? Say that again. Yeah, you know, the energy that comes through the voice and the influence of that manifestor energy on others. I imagine mm -hmm. that is part of that. Well, you're getting into a whole other two hour podcast on <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, vibration and frequency and how the sounds really affect us and might even affect our environment, how sound creates matter, right? That's a whole thing. So yeah, yeah. they have so much power and energy there that I think that they probably absolutely influence the people around them to do things. But generators, the way to manifest is to feel. Right? Right. And then there's even like specific manifesting and non-specific manifesting and your human design chart, depending on your arrow pointing, it will tell you which one that maybe is best for you. They're, it's, all, it's all for contemplation. It's like, don't do something because somebody told you to. Let's get everyone in every way and everywhere, get rid of the dogma. Yes. It's like, that's not, that's not where we're going. We're in the age of Aquarius. We're left the Piscean teachers behind. And this is all about coming together and, and, allowing ourselves to um to have new ideas and to, to the mutation and the newness to come about and for us to sit with each other and be with each other and and create communities where this new stuff will emerge you know we're at the very beginning of the age of aquarius which is all about humanity friendship friendship groups technology right ruled by uranus which is fast moving and mm, yeah 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much more, but I feel like I, I need to cut it off because <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I think you've come to a good place. I want yeah. to talk all day with you because <laughs> there's so much. Yeah, and I think um, we can uh, maybe circle back and expand on some of these topics more in, in a later interview. But I really yeah, but speaking um, of circles, with your co-creative vitality and anything mm -hmm. you want to share about that and your experiences through that and how people can you know benefit through you know going to you oh, for your yeah. services. You do astral natal chart. In soul yeah. blueprint, thank you for as well. mentioning that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, you still got yeah. enough you need to do, you know. <laughs> so I hope by the end of this interview, it makes sense why I that the term co-create vitality came about, right? This vitality, this life force in us, it it is us, and I that's my intention is to co-create with people and help them know themselves better know their intuition better, and then use their energy for things that are purposeful in this world and purposeful to them. And um, of course, you can do yoga with me anywhere locally in Northern California, which many of you might not be here. Um, I like to do retreats. We have a retreat in September. It's for women, and it's in Northern California by Lassen. Amazing opportunity to do some of this deeper work with some beautiful facilitators out in the woods. And I always am available for human design and astrology readings. And I don't necessarily separate them. It's like I usually hone in on um, an intuitive purpose that will come up while I'm looking at people's charts. And I kind of combine the astrology and the human design together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm always available for that. My website's cocreatevitality.com. <laughs> great, great. Thank you so much, Kavalia. Yeah. I, I always... Um, yeah. Feel like I'm connecting dots and gaining understanding, you know, when um, you share your your information, what you what you share from your heart and your mind, the knowledge base that you have and your ability to integrate information and embody it. Yeah. So you're a great inspiration to me. Thank wow. you. Thank you so much for letting me share. I appreciate you and share from my heart too. I love you both. <laughs> yeah, much love. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. we'll talk soon. We'll talk <laughs> soon. And thank you everyone for listening.